So we have watched the video clip of Dope is Death, which gives us a brief introduction to what we can call the social determinants of health that were faced by the Black Panthers and the Young Lords in the 60s and 70s, and in the, especially the early 70s when they decided to take over Lincoln Hospital in order to do everything they could to get their loved ones, their community, the help and support that they needed. This lecture, however, will focus more narrowly on the clinical applications of the NADA protocol and where it is outstanding in that regard. There are a couple key takeaways that I would like you to keep in mind from the required reading of Use of Acupuncture in the Treatment of Drug Addiction by Dr. Matulu Shakur, the acupuncturist, and Dr. Michael Smith, the Western-trained physician specializing in psychiatry. The key takeaways are this. Addiction and mental illness disorders are highly comorbid, and their co-occurring symptoms are frequently shared and inseparable. We find that in communities that have suffered a lot of trauma and may be using substances of abuse, misuse, in order to self-medicate. It is very difficult to separate what is, quote, mental illness and what is, quote, substance use disorder without the tincture of time and a tool like the NADA protocol to assist early on. Secondly, the emphasis on political education is certainly reminiscent of our contemporary emphasis by the whole health approach on the social determinants of health. I cannot say that enough. When the Panthers and Young Lords insisted on political education, it is certainly a euphemism for what today we are calling the social determinants of health. Clean air, clean water, clean food, access to the trash being picked up in the streets, fighting back from the infusion of drugs into one's community, etc. And finally, Naturalistic observational study is just as valuable as a randomized placebo-controlled trial in the proper context. Context does matter a great deal. For instance, even though in introducing the very first acupuncture-based detoxification program in America, even though the article spoke to findings that were observational and naturalistic in nature. Clearly, the randomized placebo-controlled interventions that existed up until that time were insufficient, woefully inadequate to address the needs of the community. I think particularly poignant in this context is that they were dealing with an opiate use disorder problem then of epidemic magnitude in the South Bronx, the same as we are today. We are still struggling with this problem. It is interesting in this context as well that the NADA protocol is the very first alternative or complementary medicine identified as a best practice in the United States. This was through SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, CSAT the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, where it recognized this protocol as a best practice in their tip number 45, or Treatment Improvement Protocol number 45, their flagship publication, where they hang their hat was on essentially the fact that it kept patients coming back. And there is nothing that matters more in terms of who gets better and who does not. There's nothing that matters more than who keeps coming back where SAMHSA CSAT hung its hat was on the ability of this protocol to enhance engagement and retention. Some additional takeaways to keep in mind. The issue of lower pharmaceutical load. The patients at Lincoln Acupuncture Detoxification Recovery Center that received the ear acupuncture that was the forerunner to the protocol that is used by the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association was given often in conjunction with methadone treatment. Those who received the protocol needed less of the methadone in order to get through the detoxification period. We find that across the board in my practice, 
as a psychiatrist in private practice and institutional settings where those who are engaged with the protocol often require less antidepressant, less antipsychotic load in order to achieve the same response. This immediately translates into less exposure to potential side effects and harm from the medications themselves that are prescribed, and we know that they all have potential side effects. We found that the protocol is effective and impactful across the stages of readiness to change, whether in an acute withdrawal state or whether at the other end where you're looking to maintain recovery but have run into a stressful situation that might be a trigger that would jeopardize that. It is useful for staff, a wellness approach in dealing with their stress and challenges of an emotional nature. The protocol is impactful across all substances observed, heroin, methadone, alcohol, nicotine, barbiturates, imitriptyline, Valium. These were the specific substances that were mentioned in the 1979 article. Certainly with this spectrum of pharmaceuticals that they mentioned in 1979, it covers virtually everything that we might look to prescribe categorically, contemporarily as well. Relief of insomnia, depression, anxiety, the relaxation and coping enhancement of the ability to deal with general life stress. We found it effective there as well. The relief of physical discomfort from withdrawal and abstinence is something that is absent in the hands of social workers, psychologists who would look to intervene who we need in terms of a recovery process, but they have no tools in their hands in order to address this directly and immediately. We found that that was another substantial finding from the 1979 article. I draw attention to the adjuvant use of the NADA protocol along with treatment as usual. It is important to emphasize that it was used alongside whatever other mainstream treatment was deemed appropriate and necessary, and it helped to enhance the outcomes therefrom. Spanning the treatment spectrum from triggers to harm reduction to relapse prevention to maintenance and wellness is a reality and message that I really want you to hold on to tightly. This is something that the NADA protocol can do uniquely in terms of spanning that entire spectrum. The final paragraph in the article spoke to a plea for funding to perform community follow-up studies. We find that even today, in terms of use of the NADA protocol and other complementary and integrative healthcare techniques, we're only now beginning to get the sort of attention and institutional funding that we really need to elaborate well the full spectrum of benefit that these uh, sorts of interventions can bring. And quote, without extensive research funding, which very few programs receive, we cannot offer statistical evidence, quote unquote. The articles that I have written with regard to the NADA protocol, a dozen or so, have all except one been conducted with elbow grease, with establishing relationships that led to implementation, doing demonstration for both staff, for patients, for providers, in the community in order to build the goodwill that would allow the ultimate implementation of such programs using the protocol. There will be another segment where we specifically address the challenge of implementation, and we won't go into that in much detail here uh, in this segment. But we will look at some systematic uh, reviews. We will look at some select articles individually as well that are particularly instructive. Before I go to the review of the, uh, the literature that we have selected, I have here a picture that depicts the ear, and the points that are used in the protocol. I want you to see that so it's not a mystery in terms of what are the acupoints that are used. Here you see the picture of an ear superimposed on that of an upside-down fetus. This is meant to point out the fact that the ear is indeed a microcosm of the entire body. Think about the motor cortex and the homunculus that is represented in the motor cortex of the brain. 
the ear has a similar homunculus that relates to the entire body. That There are one to five points that are used in application of the protocol. The first point is known as sympathetic. Number two is shin men. Number three is known as the kidney point. Number four as the liver point. Number five as the lung point. It is important to realize that the lower half of the ear is innervated entirely by the vagus nerve. That is a direct, bidirectional communication with the HPA axis and the number of areas in the brain that are responsible for emotional response, for our fight or flight response. Point number five was the point that was first used at the Lincoln Center Aid in Detoxification and Recovery. The other points, as um, stated by Dr. Uh, Shakur and Smith, quote, we learned from our patients what worked and what didn't. It was over time that the full five-point protocol was elaborated. It was in 1985 that the National Acupuncture Detoxification Organization itself was established by Dr. Smith and the five-point protocol. The NADA protocol is a user-friendly, codified and invariant one to five point ear acupuncture protocol. No diagnosis or reason other than I want to feel better or a goal of wellness is required. And I want to point out that better is the goal. There is no intervention we have that is a panacea that will take someone from severe illness to immediate wellness. Feeling better is a wonderful goal. It is the goal of each and every acupuncture treatment using the protocol. This is a goal that is easily and readily achievable with the protocol. Laymen, ancillary healthcare professionals, meaning social workers, psychologists, nurses, peer support specialists, whole health coaches, etc., can practice as physician extenders and acupuncturist extenders. In some states where laws are permissible, They can practice with general supervision of physicians or acupuncturists. The general supervision is crucial. If direct supervision is required, that means that an expensive provider like a physician or a comprehensive acupuncturist needs to be in the room every time a needle is placed. For most programs, this is not sustainable. A permissive practice environment is central to the idea of truly promoting population-based care with a public health user-friendly tool if it is to succeed. Not a practitioners are not equivalent to licensed acupuncturists. I need to say this again. The NADA practitioners are not equivalent to licensed comprehensive acupuncturists. One can become proficient in the NADA protocol with 70 hours of training. We can take a layman who's never placed a needle before but wants to be a peer support specialist and have them familiar with clean needle technique, with the patient-centered approach to the extent where they are ready to join a treatment team after 70 hours. For those already familiar with the mental health side, with the substance use side, the training is typically shorter than that for individuals such as yourselves. And there the training is generally 30 hours is required, but we still require, in addition to 30 hours of didactic training, 40 patient treatment hours need to be documented in order to demonstrate proficiency. This is compared to the three or more years after college that is required to become a comprehensive acupuncturist. There is no competition at all between those who are trained in the NADA protocol and those who are comprehensive acupuncturists. As an organization, we have even conducted a study a number of years ago uh, in a state where there was some concern amongst comprehensive acupuncturists about whether or not the NADA protocol would be taking business from them. First of all, most comprehensive acupuncturists do not treat folks that are in the throes of addiction, certainly not in poor, impoverished communities where access to care is often limited to none. Typically, they have folks that have good insurance or cash to pay out of pocket. This is useful for those who do not have access to all of that, particularly useful in those situations of scarcity. Secondly, 
What our study found is that comprehensive acupuncturists themselves did better because programs that wanted to include and use those who retrained in NADA would need folks to supervise them. And so they would call on the licensed acupuncturist, in addition to physicians, to provide that general supervision at a frequency and in a manner that was appropriate and affordable. Typically, under general supervision, the practitioner would have access to the supervisor by electronic means at any point, and very seldom did anyone ever get a call. As serving in a supervisory capacity myself for uh, over a decade, I may have gotten a handful of calls with any concern of substance during that time frame. But again, keep in mind, the idea is general supervision, not direct supervision. Direct supervision does not work. In states where direct supervision has required, even though the protocol is available on the books, in reality, very few programs can afford to have that physician on site, in the room, under the roof, every time a needle is placed. Some additional points that I want to emphasize. Now the providers will never treat points outside of those one to five points on the ear. They do not treat body points or any other ear acupoints, and that means they never do. The NADA protocol is not sufficient in isolation to resolve substance use disorder. For those that are overly enthusiastic about what acupuncture can do, I spend a lot of time emphasizing that this is not a panacea. It needs to be used in combination with a comprehensive treatment approach for those that are suffering from substance use disorder and mental illness disorder. NADA acupuncture and acupressure can support stress relief goals that do not fall under the rubric of a diagnosis. Thereby, they lend themselves to prevention and to wellness. The first article that I wish to address is one by Jackson and Company from 2021. This one used a standardized assessment tool to assess the impact of the NADA protocol on psychological distress. The focus here was on anxiety and depression. They found that the protocol helped to improve the target symptoms. They found it especially beneficial because administered within the standard of care, it did not require a separate facility meaning that in a primary care setting, in a substance use disorder setting, where you want to address issues of emotional distress directly, you can include the NADA protocol without having to send them across town to a different building, the mental health and emotional care that they need in a very direct way, often precluding the need even for psychiatric pharmaceutical intervention. And when the psychiatrist is who everyone is waiting for because they have the power of the pen to write a prescription, it means that access is limited. Wait times can be unconscionably long, especially in a situation of substance use disorder, to have someone wait months, weeks, even days to feel better when they already know how to feel better quick, fast, and in a hurry, it is a boon, a benefit to all concerned when you can have a technique and a tool available to provide immediate relief. The other significant finding by Jackson is that they were especially impactful given the prevalence of the comorbidities that were present involving both psychological distress and chronic pain as co-occurring conditions. This is a study conducted by Afrasabi and company. They used a state trait anxiety inventory and the Utrecht work engagement scales to measure outcomes. Participants in this study received only five sessions of the NADA protocol within a 16-week period. What they found was significant reductions in state and trait anxiety compared to baseline. We know that acupuncture is very reliably over the course of a half an hour, an hour, to remarkably reduce symptoms of anxiety, distress, to greatly improve mood. What is remarkable with both state and trait responses is that the trait response suggests that this improvement is long-lasting, that it is enduring. 
even outside of the brief period of time that we might expect an immediate response to take place. In this manner, it certainly differentiates itself from the benzodiazepines and even from the antihistamines that we often will use to address anxiety from a pharmaceutical standpoint, i.e. it seems to be that patients learn greater self-control from the inside out from the use of this protocol. This is another reason we tell our practitioners to always try to absent themselves as the agents of change when engaging with the patients. We want patients to realize that the improvements they feel are coming from the inside out. This is sometimes a novel experience for patients that perhaps for a long time have felt that they are broken and can't get better. For them to feel that, hey, wow, with these few needles or with the beads that are placed on my ear, I can choose to come for treatment. I can choose to manually stimulate or even apply the beads myself. And wow, I'm learning how to better control my own emotional state and make choices that are better. Forsabi and company also found significant increases in overall scores measuring engagement. SAMHSA CSAT, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, hung its hat in 2006 on identifying this protocol as a best practice was on the area of engagement and retention. There is nothing more important to who gets better than who keeps coming back, who is retained and compliant with keeping up with a treatment schedule. This study underscored that the protocol supports that. The NOT protocol is an effective strategy to reduce and may improve engagement is something that is found in most of the studies where we find the protocol applied. Here we find a study conducted by a colleague of mine, Oshan Perlmutter, and I was a collaborator here on this study, published in 2019. A single acupoint was treated using acupressure. There were no needles used in this study. Participants were work sites within the psychiatry department in a large healthcare system that included those providing care in the emergency room, in inpatient services, outpatient services, and consult liaison services throughout the hospital system. So there were both inpatient and outpatient participants. A standardized assessment tool that was used was the Professional Quality of Life, the GAD, the Generalized Anxiety Disorder Scale, the GAD-7. These two scales were used to measure outcomes. This study was the first to show that auricular acupressure at the Shin Min Acupoint reduces symptoms of anxiety and burnout in behavioral health care providers. Reducing burnout is critical, and we all know the sort of stresses we went through during the COVID pandemic. When burnout occurs, also on the heels of that is compassion fatigue. We get tired. We get emotionally burned out. It's hard to keep giving your heart over and over and over again. There's the issue of secondary trauma that can be experienced. This is a very important finding that a single acupressure point on the ear applied at Shin Men, which is a master point in terms of acupuncture practice, can help to reduce anxiety and burnout. We found that 60% of respondents subjectively reported benefits, including less stress, more patience with patients, sleeping better, and being more mindful. We know, of course, that sleep is the canary in the mind. It's the first thing to get worse. It's often the last thing to get better when we're in situations of trauma, of stress. And even though this study did not look at mental illness disorders per se or substance use disorders per se, insomnia is often one of the symptoms that is most difficult to address. We found that this was certainly improved even using a single acupressure point amongst behavioral health care providers. The other important finding was that the acupressure point was well tolerated. The most that was found in terms of any complaint at all may have been a bit of irritation if the gold-plated magnet organic vicarious seed was left in place for several days to a week that there may have been some irritation at the site. That is why we always recommend removing the bead at the end of a week if it hasn't come off uh, by that time. And you can place the bead at either the front or the back of that acu point on the ear. Not a protocol ear acupressure is a non-verbal treatment. Not a protocol ear acupuncture is a non-verbal treatment. 
It does not require a mental health or a substance use diagnosis in order to initiate use or achieve the benefits that can be derived. There is no learning curve required for individuals in order to benefit from this self-care treatment or if the treatment is administered to them. This is in stark distinction to what we find in mindfulness-based stress reduction with yoga, tai chi, all of which are wonderful. As a whole health coach myself, in addition to the practice of psychiatry and acupuncture, these are wonderful techniques that we eventually want to educate our patients about and introduce them to. However, when you have someone coming in for care in the throes of acute withdrawal, in the throes of acute emotional distress, that is often not the time to say, hey, let me teach you some yoga postures now. Let me introduce you to mindfulness-based stress reduction and, and walk you through steps in order to get the benefit from that. This is a passive treatment. Patients come in, they sit in a chair, you put the needles in their ears, and you do get benefits that are parallel to the other complementary and integrative health modalities that we can and should be teaching in this era when we as a medical profession, as a healing profession, have finally come to realize the benefits of complementary and integrative techniques, many of which are of ancestral lineage that go back thousands of years. However, to get the patient into a state of psychological readiness and mindedness that is optimal. It is great to have a protocol like this as a foundation of treatment so that when they come in the door, they can get a not a protocol treatment. They're emotionally much calmer and ready to learn. I like to think about the example of the student in class who has studied hard. They know all the material and they get so anxious they forget it all because at test time, we know that occurs. Folks will tend to Black out sometimes simply from the stress of a situation or situations that may exist, either externally or internally. The NADA protocol helps to mitigate all of that and helps to promote psychological preparedness so that our patients are better able and ready to benefit from the psychosocial interventions that we will want to introduce them to, from even pharmaceutical education that they will need to have in order to be optimally compliant and to be able to be retained into treatment optimally. It helps to prepare them mentally and emotionally benefit optimally from treatment. I want to point out as well that what we typically promote is the magnetic acupressure beads. An entire set of those for a single treatment will cost less than a dime, less than 10 cents per treatment. In terms of bang for the buck, there is nothing that is comparable to this. Adjuvant, not a protocol, outperforms not a protocol alone in mental health and substance use disorder treatment. For those of you that are research-minded, do not seek to only pick a patient, have their ear exposed, have someone put a needle in, and then go home and come back and compare outcomes to usual and customary treatment. You will find that they will likely not do as well as those receiving usual and customary treatment. Such an approach is similar to thinking just because someone with alcohol use disorder comes in and we treat them with Librium to keep them from going into DTs. They're comfortable when we send them home. They've detoxed off the Librium and now think that somehow their alcohol use disorder has been treated sufficiently or satisfactorily. The analogy is similar. Both Librium has and the NADA protocol have a role in treatment, but they should be part of a comprehensive treatment program not used in isolation with outcomes when used in isolation compared to those when used as an adjuvant to usual and customary treatment. I reference here the textbook of the American Psychiatric Association, their textbook on the treatment of substance use disorder published in 2021. This is the most recent one. I reference them because there were two acupuncture articles that were decided as worthy of mention in terms of the research approach, in terms of the impressiveness of the outcomes. One of those articles were those published by myself and 
my colleague Oshun Perlmuter, who is a nurse practitioner, the study looked at using the NADA protocol in comparison to treatment as usual for 100 participants at a well-established substance abuse treatment center. 50 patients were randomized to treatment as usual plus the protocol. 50 were randomly assigned to treatment as usual only. The treatment as usual plus NADA protocol group showed significantly higher quality of life scores at three months and at six month follow up. The interesting thing to note here is that the period of active treatment was one month. There was no treatment administered after they completed the treatment program at the end of that month. Many of those participating were court ordered. We did follow-up calls at three months after they had entirely completed treatment and at six months after they had entirely completed treatment. The group that received the NADA protocol continued to show an increase in improvement, whereas those who had not received the NADA protocol demonstrated a substantial deterioration back toward their baseline before treatment. And this is a common finding in the substance use treatment world, where we know this is an illness of recurrence and relapse. It is apparent that the NADA protocol can help to support long-term recovery and improvement in terms of quality of life, better engagement with family, more likely to have a job. All of those things are critically important, and the protocol can help to support that. The final article that I'd like to review here is actually a systematic review of acupuncture interventions for suicidality conducted by Kwan and his associates. This was just published in March of 2023. One notable feature of the studies on acupuncture for suicidal behavior found in this systematic review is the frequent use of the NADA protocol. The investigators found that this treatment can be beneficial in the treatment of major depression and PTSD. The investigators commented that as mental illnesses, including major depression, substance use disorder, and PTSD, that as mental illnesses, These elements of distress, these conditions of distress, are tightly associated with a high risk of suicidal behavior. They conclude that the NADA protocol has the potential to directly or indirectly contribute to the reduction of suicidal behaviors in individuals with mental conditions. A perspective observational study that Kwan and his associates drew our attention to. This was using the NADA protocol as an element of comprehensive medical and non-medical services for substance use. They found a statistically significant reduction in suicidal ideation to a significant p-value of 0.005 within a four-week comprehensive program for individuals with substance use disorder. So the question is asked, is there enough scientific evidence for NADA? This is what we know for sure. Ear acupuncture affects the autonomic nervous system in a favorable way. It helps to calm the HPA axis. It helps to balance the HPA axis. It does this via stimulation of the vagus nerve and trigeminal nerve, stress-reducing neurotransmitters and hormones that are released. Also, we know that in a number of randomized studies, there has been a report of a positive effect on mental illness as well as substance use disorder, including suicidal ideation, which is the holy grail on the treatment of mental illness and in psychiatry. We also know that in large-scale literature reviews, high on the evidence ladder for certainty, they state that ear acupuncture's positive effect can be seen on several of the symptoms that NADA is typically used for in a usual and customary manner of treatment for individuals and in programs and positively affects the outcomes that we look for in the treatment of mental conditions. Moving on to those who say, I support the use of NADA in the name of pragmatism. It's pragmatic. Why is it pragmatic? The evidence is sufficiently strong to support the adjuvant use of NADA protocol in line with other complementary and integrative health modalities already in use in mental health. Here, the mindfulness-based stress reduction approaches that are popular now, that came into vogue a couple of decades ago, are part of that complementary integrative health modality that we have strong evidence for. 
We know that the Nada protocol can induce a similar state of mindfulness, a similar state of internal reflection, a similar state of self-regulation, but from a passive perspective. For instance, if we have someone coming in in the throes of acute stimulant intoxication, say from cocaine or methamphetamine, or severe withdrawal, say from opiate use disorder or alcohol uh, withdrawal, this is not the time when most are psychologically ready to benefit from the sort of mindfulness-based stress reduction approaches that really require that person to be psychologically ready and willing to participate. Even in the obstreperous patient, the irritable patient, who only wants to sit in a chair, as long as we can put the needles in their ears, the beads on their ears, they will get that sense of a relaxation response in a very predictable fashion, in a passive way that will help to prepare them to be better ready and able in a shorter period of time to benefit from the psychosocial modalities that a treatment program or a provider may be ready to offer. There needs to be a balance, a pragmatic balance between research and clinical experience. The anecdotal experience for the NADA protocol is very powerful. It's very powerful. Typically, patients say that I get a relaxation response. They come back the next day and say, hey, I slept better. They say I can concentrate. I can focus better. And because of the fact that patients, providers, uh, our acupuncture detoxification specialists that are trained through a standardized approach through the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association, they are trained to approach treatment from a patient-centered aspect of care. For instance, if a patient only wants one needle in this one to five needle protocol, that's fine. If they want to choose where they want to sit, which provider they want to treat them on any given day, if there's a choice, they're encouraged to do that. If they want to come in on any given day and say, hey, you know, I'm fine with just the beads today. I'm doing much better. That's fine. There is lots of flexibility. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this. Keep in mind that there is enough scientific evidence for the use of the NADA protocol in mental conditions, in mental illnesses, mental health disorders, and substance use disorders. However, the treatment itself is not targeted toward any particular disorder. It is meant to mitigate symptoms. And frankly, that's how we use our medications in psychiatry and mental health as well. If a patient has major depression and may be having psychotic features, we will use an antipsychotic. If they're psychotic and having lots of depression and anxiety, we'll also use an antidepressant and an anxiolytic. The NADA protocol is not diagnosis focused. It is transdiagnostic addressing symptoms that we find across a variety of diagnoses. It is also pan-symptomatic. It is challenging to find any symptom that we are presented with in mental conditions, in substance use disorder or addiction that is not improved through the use of the protocol. In closing, I really want to leave you with the confidence to move forward with the protocol. It is safe. It is inexpensive. It is a population-based approach to care that is also person-centered. I wish you much success in moving forward with your own experience in using the protocol once you have, have the training.